Hello, in this week's video, I will be going into great detail on how to curate a historically inspired sewing room on a budget. When designing and setting up my sewing room, I knew I wanted to be very particular to my individual tastes. The majority of sewing rooms that I see on Pinterest or Instagram are very practical, which makes sense. It's supposed to be more practical than pretty, I guess you could say. I guess I'm really the odd one out. So if anything, maybe don't take this advice if you're just looking for practicality in your sewing room. But yeah, the majority of sewing rooms that I see online are very practical. There aren't a lot of design elements or design cohesion to them. The only sewing room that I can think of that is like historically inspired would be Bernadette Banners. A lot of the sewing rooms that I see online are notoriously cluttered. If you know anything about sewing, which I assume you do because you're watching this video, it is a hobby that involves a lot of moving parts. However, I knew I wanted my sewing room to nicely and easily store away those moving parts when not being used. As a dress historian, I knew that I wanted my sewing room to really transport me to my favorite time period. So my particular aesthetic is a classic New England colonial Americana home that I live in, but it's the 1950s, which is extremely particular to say the least. I totally recognize that. I love colonial architecture and design elements, but my particular area of interest in dress history is the mid 20th century, particularly from 1920 to 1970. So I really wanted to merge those two worlds together. So basically I wanted to have my room be colonial inspired and then have all of my sewing machine and my sewing notions be more so mid-century. But whatever your particular style is, maybe you like art deco architecture, but you sew Victorian inspired clothing or vice versa, you can definitely apply these same principles that I use when creating my sewing room. So my first suggestion would be to really examine the design elements from the period that you admire. So for me, I did months of research on colonial interiors. Colonial homes are characterized by certain colors, usually wainscoting or beadboard in some part of the home, painted moldings around doors or windows, particular rug patterns, and candelabras that now have been transformed into light fixture candelabras. What I feel really defines 18th century design is the wainscoting or beadboard and the moldings. For my space, I ended up choosing beadboard because I feel like it gives a little more of a cottagey, cozy feel to my space. When picking out a paint color, I researched the most popular paint colors in the 18th century. I looked at a lot of colonial Williamsburg homes and interior to get inspiration. I was torn between like a light sage green and white blue. In the end, I chose this blue color that you can see in the background because I feel like the light green would have potentially clashed with holiday decorations. Like that's how deep I thought about this decision. The paint color I chose is called Williamsburg White Blue, and I got it from Benjamin Moore. They actually have a whole entire range of just colonial inspired paint colors, which I think is really cool. If you wanted to make a Victorian inspired sewing room, examine those rooms. Victorian rooms are kind of characterized by a lot of wood paneling, intricately carved wood paneling, patterned, sometimes darkly colored wallpaper, a lot of knickknacks, gold framed paintings on the walls. If I personally was doing a Victorian inspired sewing room, I might choose a lightly patterned wallpaper. I would try to put up a few oil paintings and choose intricately designed furniture. A Victorian style room really does lend itself to a lot of mismatch patterns. So that would definitely be um, an option. Whereas I feel like with colonial design, having too many patterns in one space isn't as true to the period. Um, I'm sure there were some spaces like that, but I personally chose colonial because I grew up in a historic home. I absolutely love the stately homes in New England. And I feel like colonial interiors are not as busy, not as cluttered, but are still beautiful in their own right. I really imagined what a sewing room in an 18th century home in 1950s America would look like, or more importantly, what that wouldn't look like, what wouldn't be in that space. Any items that didn't align with that vision in my mind, which is basically just like modern things, would be neatly stored away. So I had to definitely make sure I had space to neatly store away those items. Next, let's get to the fun part furnishings. You might be thinking, I would love to have some colonial or Victorian inspired furniture in my sewing room, but antiques like that are just so, so expensive and unattainable. Fear not my friend, because I have a solution for you. 
estate sales. Estate sales. So I got this colonial inspired desk for $60 and I got my colonial inspired dresser for $12. I also got a gorgeous colonial inspired dining table that I intended to be my cutting table in near pristine condition for $100. Unfortunately, it didn't fit comfortably in my rather small space that I have here. So right now I'm just using it as my dining room table. There are a plethora of beautiful pieces at estate sales that don't even get any interest, don't get bid on, and are eventually thrown away at the end of the sale because nobody will take them. While my furniture does have some staining and scratches, I actually prefer it that way. This is my sewing room where I am working all the time. I wouldn't want to worry about ruining glossy, pristine furniture. So if you know nothing about estate sales, let me tell you how I acquired these pieces. I used a site called Auction Ninja. I'm sure there are many sites similar to this that you could just as easily use. I input my zip code and it showed me all the places near me where there were estate sales or auctions. I think they're the same thing basically. The one really, really great feature about this site is that they have everything listed online where you can browse and you can bid on everything from the comfort of your own home. Like you don't actually have to go in person wondering if maybe you'll even find anything that you like because you know that does take a lot of time and energy so i love being able to just browse every week and just see what they have during the 40s 50s 60s a lot of furniture was colonial inspired this was like the popular furniture style of the time and most of the furniture was made in the united states out of real wood of course affordable furniture nowadays is usually made out of particle board and only has a wood veneer i remember i was going to purchase something from pottery barn at some Point and it was just so expensive and I justified the price because I, I didn't really know anything about estate sales yet. And I remember I called because I was interested on what this furniture was made out of. And I called and they said that it's a pine veneer and particle board underneath. And Pottery Barn is like really expensive. So you would expect them to have real wood, but even they didn't have furniture made out of real wood. So when you're buying furniture, maybe just check on that. It's also crazy that this amazingly well-crafted furniture that is considered an antique at this point because it's like 60 or 70 years old is actually cheaper than furniture that I would have purchased at Ikea. I just, that's so crazy. I think like the cheapest desk at Ikea is like $100 and a nice mid-range desk is about 300. Now, I live in the Northeastern United States, so I am spoiled when it comes to the sheer number of estate sales that are in my area. I also remember seeing a post about how the UK doesn't really do estate sales. So if your area does not have estate sales, you can also find great, great and affordable pieces of furniture on eBay. All you have to do is you have to input your zip code, sort by distance, select local pickup only, and then you'll see all of the people who are selling stuff in your area that you can just go pick up. If you don't do it that way, you're gonna first find a lot of third-party Amazon-like sellers that are just trying to sell new stuff on eBay. And if you find something that you really, really like and it's in a different country or in a completely different area that's super far away where you're gonna have to get shipping, that shipping is probably going to be more expensive than the piece itself. Items that are just only local pickup are generally super, super inexpensive. And sometimes they're even free. They just say, get this off my hands and you can have this item for free. So that's another amazing avenue that people who do not live near estate sales can use. Another great site to use is Craigslist or your country's equivalent to Craigslist. Just be careful when picking items up. Definitely go with somebody because we do not stand murderers. We do not stand kidnappers. Another great way to find amazingly beautiful pieces is just driving around looking at what people are throwing out. I know this chest behind me, I garbage picked that like a few years ago. I love the way it looked. It doesn't close the right way, but I mean, regardless, it's still a functioning chest and it even has like history behind it. It has a little tag on it that says the person's name is cut off, but it says from Vanderbilt University. So I assume that a person used that chest when they were in college at Vanderbilt University And I just think that's just so interesting and cool now If you are going to be garbage picking or picking things up from the side of the road Just be careful when handling anything that has fabric on it There might be a reason why people are getting rid of that it could be infested with bugs You don't know you do not want to bring that into your home and then it goes on to other fabric surfaces And then you have an entire infestation also there could be some water damage or some some other structural problem that you don't know about and then you could possibly hurt yourself when you get it home. 
So just be careful um, when it comes to that. Now, a caveat to estate sales and when you're picking up any sort of furniture pieces, you really do have to take into account the size of the furniture and how you are going to transport it back to your home. I have like a crossover type, CRV type of um, car. So the dresser that we have just fit, but I had to make sure to know the measurements know what I could fit in the car. So if you're going to use that site, um, Auction Ninja, the measurements are usually always um, on the website, which is really great because it helps you plan. So when we actually picked up these two pieces, because we got them at the same estate sale, we had to make two trips because the dresser just barely squeezed into the car. We had to go drop it off and then go back and then get this desk. So um, just plan for that, plan ahead. Um, estate sales sometimes only offer a window of two or three hours to pick up the piece. So um, just keep that in mind. So when curating your perfect space, it is essential to plan, have patience, or compromise. If you are in a rush and pick things out and purchase things that are a little more pricey than you wanted to or not as great as you envisioned, nine times out of ten the next week, you will find the perfect thing and regret your purchase that you made in haste. That always happens, it seems. So yeah, just keep that in mind, I know from experience. You may not find exactly what you want right away. You might have to wait a few months to find the perfect piece. That's really all part of the process and really designing the room of your dreams on a budget. There are things that I did not want to compromise on. Like I am a stickler for matching. Just something about uniformity like eases my soul. I don't know why, but I do not like when furniture doesn't match, when it's like maybe not the same style or not the same color. So I was specifically looking for sets. Now finding a desk that is the same style as a dresser is very particular. So I had to kind of be a little innovative. So I would search for bedroom sets that had a vanity, which is basically a desk and a dresser. And that is how I found these two pieces that match each other. Unfortunately, the vanity did not come with a matching chair, so I waited to find a chair that would match the color of this wood perfectly. Matching colors is hard to do with photos online. Thankfully, I got lucky um, with this chair that I'm sitting in right now. I had to wait a few months, and in that time, I was using like a dining chair, and I knew that I did not want to use a dining chair as my sewing chair. So after a few months, I finally found this beautiful antique swivel desk chair that matches my desk color perfectly. This was honestly such a great find because finding a vintage swivel desk chair on wheels is like almost impossible. If you look it up, you will like not find any of them unless you get an antique that is like wildly expensive. Now, as most sewers know, your sewing chair is like really important because being at a machine hunched over for hours sewing can be supremely uncomfortable. So the type of chair and the comfortability of your chair really does matter. The nice thing about modern desk chairs is that they are extremely comfortable. However, the design aesthetic of modern desk chairs do not match my design aesthetic. So finding an antique desk chair that swivels, is made out of 100% real wood, matches my aesthetic, matches my desk color, and is super comfortable was a literal godsend. It pays to wait. It pays to wait. By the way, this chair was $60. Now, I didn't know this when I purchased it, but this chair is missing a wheel. Um, I do have to put a book underneath it to prop it up. But honestly, that is something I am willing to compromise with for having a very comfortable chair that matches my furniture. Now, I do make an exception for my furniture matching if the wood of another piece of furniture is a certain color. Like if I have all of my brown woods matching and then I have like a red or a blue or a yellow, that to me is not going to clash as much. Like my mirror is red, so I don't think it clashes like a bunch of different colored browns would. Now a mirror is one of the most essential elements of a sewing room. I knew I wanted a mirror that was obviously antique looking and would be a stand-up mirror, not a wall-mounted mirror. I didn't have much luck finding mirrors that I liked at estate sales, so I looked online and I found this beauty for $60 on Wayfair. I think it looks great and it does the job. I also think it's a nice design element that kind of stands out, but not too much, and it also pulls together all of the other antique design elements in the room. If you can find modern, affordable pieces of furniture that match your particular aesthetic, I say go for it, as long as it's something you know you're going to love and hopefully have for the rest of your life. Next are all of the actual 
actual notions that you use to sew and construct a garment. Sew in iron, a sewing machine, thread, scissors. I would say about 80% of all of my notions are historically accurate to the mid 20th century and were all probably cheaper than if I purchased them brand new. These are really the items that allow me to feel like I am a 1950s dressmaker. I actually collect vintage sewing machines and I purchased this sewing machine for about, I think it was about $150 on eBay. I think that's about comparable to a modern machine. Maybe it's a little bit more expensive. All of my needles are either from the 1900s or from the 1940s. I got them all off eBay for less than $5. I have sort of an addiction to mid-century wooden spooled thread. It's just so pretty and the majority of them are cotton or silk, which I love because it's not synthetic and I'm able to compost all of my scraps. Plus the wooden spools just look so cool. All of my buttons are from eBay as well. You could just type in vintage buttons lot. If it's something small enough, generally it will already be in a lot of one or more. A lot is considered, I think one or more items usually I would say. I got a whole bag of vintage buttons. I think it was about maybe like 30 um, packets of buttons for about $15. Now, in getting my iron, I was excited, so I did get two. I got a no frills 1940s workhorse of an iron, and then I got a general electric iron from the 1950s. So far, I really am loving my 1940s iron. I can plug it in for about 10 minutes and it will stay hot for like two hours, which is just, I love that. It's just easy that I don't have to worry about a cord while I'm moving around and trying to iron. Although if you do decide to get a vintage iron, definitely be careful because they get exceptionally hot and there are no uh, like safety precautions, like they don't turn off after a certain amount of time, so just be careful. So not only am I getting historically accurate notions that I can actually use, but nine times out of 10, they're better than their modern counterparts. So it's a great and sustainable way to stock your sewing room if you don't already have these items. Plus, I feel like using these notions in everyday dressmaking or tailoring really does add to that time traveler effect. However, for me, it is not all or nothing. I have a lot of modern conveniences that I love. I use modern zippers, modern interfacing, but I just hide those things away until I need them. So I keep all of my notions in biscuit or cookie tins that I got off of eBay. These were all less than $20 and most of them are less than $10. And I just keep all of my items in here. Like I have some needles and closures in here. Um, I believe I have all of my buttons in here. I got these off of eBay for, I think like $10. They're all vintage buttons. But yeah, these are such a great way to, first of all, sustainably store all of your notions because they will last forever, obviously. And they're just a little piece of history that you can have around you. It's like really these little things that make you feel like you're living in a different time. And I'm not saying you wanna live in a different time. You just wanna kind of feel like you're there just while you're sewing. Like, look how pretty this tin is. It is so intricately designed. Next, I would say choose your colors wisely. Like I have this Queen Elizabeth tin from her coronation in 1953 and the blue on the tin actually matches the blue in my room. I knew that the focal color in my room would be this Williamsburg white blue. So I made sure that nothing else would be too busy or clash with it. Also getting this area rug was probably my biggest challenge. I just was so worried about getting something that would either make my room look too small. I wasn't sure on the color. I wasn't sure on the pattern. I knew I wanted my space to feel cozy and comfortable. So I was leaning toward like a darker color, but then I thought, what about in summer when I want things to be like light and breezy? I, I was thinking maybe I should go for like a beige or maybe like a light green. I just wasn't sure. But in the end, I ended up choosing a darker red color for my area rug. Colonial rugs were generally dark. And I also, I have two large black dogs and I could definitely see their hair more easily on a lighter colored carpet. So that is how I made my decision. I think the dark red and the Williamsburg white blue actually go really well together. And if you look closely at the carpet, there are also little specks of grayish blue, which match the blue on the walls actually quite well. So I was actually really happy with my decision. I didn't want to get a carpet at an estate sale because it's something that somebody else has walked on their entire life. I don't want to pay for a carpet cleaning service that could get expensive. So I just picked up a carpet off of, I think it was either Overstock or Wayfair. They have endless, 
endless options. Like if you want an area rug, you can find it on one of those sites, like thousands of options. And they have real wool rugs and um, you know polyester rugs as well. I think I got this for about $180, which I think is so great for an area rug. I don't know if it's real wool. I think I got the one that's polyester. I think I did get the cheaper one. I knew the rug would be the most busy pattern in the room and pretty much the focal point in terms of pattern. So although I do want to put artwork on the walls, I am a little nervous that it will clash with all of the other design elements of the room or make it too busy. Then again, when I look in historic colonial homes, they always have artwork on the walls and it looks great. So I think I'm just overthinking it. Also, it's hard to find old timey painted landscapes online for less than $100, which makes sense because artists should be well compensated for their work. But for now, I think I'm going to hold off. I was actually even thinking of using some like maybe Bob Ross or other YouTube tutorials to maybe even make my own art. I don't know, maybe that could be an interesting future video. Another thing that is essential to a sewing room is a dress form. Now, professional dress forms can get very, very pricey. I originally wanted a wolf form and then I found out that they were $800 and uh, yeah, that was a hard no. But after years of sewing, I finally decided to get a professional dress form. So I invested in the dress form behind me. It's from the shop company. I believe it was about $230. I, I pretty much got the most basic one. You can get ones with with arms and legs that can go up to like $500, which is really, really expensive. However, a great and affordable alternative that I used for years was a display form. The nice thing about this form is that it doesn't look particularly modern and you can actually pin into it. I think it's made of maybe styrofoam underneath. Unlike this form, um, I can't really pin all the way into it. I can only pin like up. I honestly forgot where I got this, but I believe it was about $60, so super affordable. The only caveat is that they only come in small, medium, and large, but if you get a smaller size, you can always pad it out to your specific proportions. I think I got a medium and I got lucky with it fitting my proportions pretty well. So this could be a solution for you if you cannot afford a professional dress form, but also don't want to get one of the plastic adjustable dress forms. I think what really makes my room um, cozy and quintessentially like colonial inspired is the molding and beadboard. I actually did all of this myself and it wasn't particularly cheap, but by doing it by myself, I did save thousands of dollars. Like you could probably do every reno you can think of by yourself within reason, of course, with YouTube tutorials. And that's exactly what I did. And honestly, like I am weak as fuck, so I can't really lift that much. And even I could do all of this by myself and manage with a half decent job. It just might take a little longer than if a professional would do it. I know it took me like a few months more than what I planned for, but I think in the end it was definitely worth it. All of the beadboard and molding I got was about $400. I got it from Home Depot. You also need a miter saw. I think it's called a miter saw. One of those circular saws that you bring down onto the item. Um, I got that off Amazon for about $200. You need a hammer, a rubber mallet, nails. They said you need like this liquid nails, like glue stuff, but I didn't use that. I used just regular nails and then wood fill as well. The paint that I purchased, which was from Benjamin Moore, was about $30 a can. Um, that's actually pretty expensive for paint, I think, but um, I love the way it looks. I think it's worth it to get some good paint if you can afford it, of course. I also purchased my light fixture off of Wayfair for about $150, which is very expensive for a light fixture. I could have gotten something at an estate sale, but I really wanted to make sure that the wiring was intact because I knew I was going to put this in myself. So I really hope that my tips inspired you to create the sewing room of your dreams. Or even if you're just wanting to maybe redesign your living room or your bedroom and you don't really like modern options, I hope that maybe you could take some of the tips and utilize them in your own design. I know it was so much more affordable than I thought it would be. Being patient and getting beautiful matching furniture for less than I would get at Ikea honestly feels so good. Like I feel like I'm like beating the system or something. I also hope that if you are able-bodied, you feel inspired to take on projects that you might've thought you had to hire somebody to do. There is literally every tutorial you can think of on YouTube. This project was really an investment in what makes me happy and my cozy inviting space inspires me to create and enjoy every minute of it. I also know that these pieces will never go out of style because I'm not furnishing my home based on current furniture trends. Anyway, thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please go ahead and give this video a like and subscribe. I hope you have a great week otherwise. Bye.